Okay, so tonight we're going to be uh, talking about Roman society and culture. So we kind of move moving away from religion. Now it's just what was their daily life like and such. Um, and so you know we're going through kind of Roman society and culture first, uh, and then we're going to be tackling the Jewish uh, culture in the in the first century uh, at the end. And so uh, um, so first, they, you know. Roman and Jewish culture at this point is very uh, similar. Um, and you'll see when we go through the Jewish culture that there were different parts of it that were more influenced by Greco-Roman culture uh, than others. Uh, there still was a strong influence. So the uh, ancient Roman world was organized into different social classes. Uh, when we say social class, we don't mean the same thing as social status uh, like today for a couple reasons. One, uh, when you think of social status, it has to do with like your wealth, your connections, and how powerful you are. Uh, the social class, uh, the interesting thing about it is, is that you, um, you could be very rich and be in a low class, and you could be in abject poverty and be in a high class. Uh, so the, your wealth was not what it was. It was actually a, a name thing. You're inheriting it almost like a royal family line. So you're, you inherit it and you can have it. And so you can have that, uh, um, that royalty or noble blood in you. Uh, and yet your life could be, be horrible. Um, also you, you were, there were ways, um, that, uh, um, you could you know move from one to the other but it was official like it wasn't it was it wasn't like oh you're kind of high class or you're this it's like no you you had to have this much uh possessions this much money and then you officially became that and it was recorded as such and and, and kept within records uh so it, it was a little bit more than just social status so in this you have the social class uh the top one being the senatorial order um and uh, this allowed you to, in essence, serve in the Senate. Uh, we would think of these as noblemen. Uh, they would wear a broad purple stripe on the togas everywhere you went. You knew if you were encountering one of these. Uh, to be counted as one of these, there was two key ways, uh, both through the family. The one being that you were from the original families of the founding of Rome and the royalty that was there, and that was the patrician class. So if you were kind of from the fathers, from the founding fathers, you were in the patrician class. Uh, and there were, at the beginning of the Roman Empire, so right around uh, the first century BC, uh, there were very few, it was like, I think, um, like six to eight families that were that were in that group uh but that ended up being broadened out to almost 600 families as the empire uh grew the so if you were in one of those lines then you were qualified to be uh, a senator uh, and you were considered to be of high status uh, the uh, julio claudian line was what julius caesar came through uh, and then you have the flavians which is the vespasian and such and this also goes along a little bit with what we talked about in the religious beliefs of the fact that each family had uh, a, um, oh, what did I call them again? Genius. Genius, yeah. So there's the genius of the family. So behind one of those powerful names, you're thought to have this genius within the family uh, uh, that would be behind that. Uh, now, uh, have, have any of you guys... Uh, watched you know things like like uh um downton's abbey or something like that you guys watch any of that it's just kind of interesting if you watch some of that you'll see how the class there there still is a thing like you have royal blood but you're completely out of money and so you marry somebody who has a lot of money uh that's kind of the very start of downton's abbey is that they had almost ran out of money but they had all of this land and property uh so the son marries into a very rich family to help cover the the price but she gets the name out of it, and he gets the money out of it. Um, and so that often would happen. Now, the nobles, uh, which we now would call nobles, they are people that descended from men who had held counselship. Uh, and so 
they, it was possible to um, be voted as as council, having moved up through the the various different um, uh, tracks politically. And council was like president. So if you had served as president, your descendants then were now in the patristic class, uh, even if you had maybe not started there yourself. Um, so the wealth and qualifications for becoming uh, coming into the senator class, uh, you had to own land, and you had to have a minimum of 250,000 denarii to be admitted to the Senate. Uh, now, you know, owning the land and, and being in the patristic class allowed you to be fit for the Senate. To actually join the Senate and be on the Senate, you had to have this amount of money, which is why some people, even though they had that upper class qualification, did not want to be in the Senate. They didn't have an interest in politics, and they didn't want to spend the money on just being in the Senate. Uh, and so that some of those chose to be the next group down that we're going to talk about, which is going to be the equestrians. Uh, eventually, as Rome became a larger and larger empire, uh, how close you were to Rome geographically became important as well <coughs> as to whether you could serve in the Senate and be considered, um, well, whether you could serve in the Senate, we'll put it that way. Now this, if you were born into this class and you were expected by the family to continue in the senatorial line, uh, you started what's called the cursus Honorum, which is the basically the um, process by which you would move up the political chain, uh, move up the political ladder uh, step by step. So the first thing is your education. You uh, they usually end around 20 years of age, and then once you are done with your education, you take a minor post uh, in Rome. That post could be you know something like collecting taxes. It could be something like keeping track of the. Uh, um, the regulations on fishing and stuff like that, just smaller tasks like that uh, within Rome. After you would fulfill that, you would then serve within the military uh, as either a tribune uh, over a legion, or some of these services often, you know, you went and you were a tribune, but you served almost like a staff office. If you guys are familiar, familiar with the military at all, you know that there are certain officers that may be high ranking, but they're called staff officers because they're actually just in charge of the movement of things here and there. They're not commanding soldiers. And so a lot of times, uh, those that were going towards the Senate and politics and such would be put in those staff offices uh, within the military, not necessarily always a commanding role. Um, once you served uh, in the military, uh, you may actually take a few years of just a break. So sometimes they didn't go directly into the next step. Uh, but the next step would have been serving as a as a caster uh, uh, in Rome, and this is some sort of financial officer in the various different places uh, within the government. Uh, and so you would go take one of those positions, be doing that, learning all the finances and so on and so forth. Then eventually, once you're done with that, you would qualify to serve as a senator. Uh, you could serve as a senator for a time. Uh, and again, to be in the Senate, there was, there was a cost to it, uh, and then you had to be uh, selected to be on the Senate. And then, after you had been a se senator for a while, uh, some people just got to be a senator and that's it. In other words, they, they got to that point and, and they were done. They stayed a senator the rest of their life. Uh, others moved up to uh, Prior, and the Prior is going to be uh, um, having more... Um, actual authority in the military you're going to be actually in control either of us of a small region or an area uh, or over um, a larger uh, group of soldiers uh, and then once you were done with that and some made it to there and stop but others would get to be on that and they become a provincial governor or a legionary commander um, or a judge um, so <clears throat> provincial governor for instance that we encounter in scripture would be uh, Pontius Pilate, which we, uh, and when we talked about the history, when you have um, the uh, um, Quirinius that we talked about here and there, he had served as a governor. The uh, the the ones that were up in in uh, um, I'm trying to remember who it was that uh, the Roman that came down, that the Cestius who came down to Ju uh, Jerusalem and surrounded it, and then got sent back. Cestius would have been one of these. Uh, you have a uh, legionary commander. Uh, and uh, which I think you guys know, but that's a, that's over 
uh, a large legion. There was about, I'm trying to remember how many legions exactly there were. But uh, the legionary commander here would not be just over a single legion. At this stage, you would be actually commanding three or four legions. You'd be in a province. Like you'd have, they had like three different legionary commanders along the Danube River, two along the Rhine River, uh, two in Africa, uh, two in Syria. Interestingly, they didn't have any in Turkey and Greece because they didn't keep legions there because the people were so loyal they took care of their own stuff and, and there was no worries about it. Uh, the judge, we come across uh, a judge in 1 Corinthians, uh, and he's functioning in Corinth. Paul, remember, is uh, uh, brought before him, and the ruler of the synagogue is brought before him, and the judge, I'm trying to remember his name, he, uh, he decides, hey, this is a matter between Jew, two Jewish sects. You guys go deal with it, go govern, govern it by your own laws. I'm not going to make a decision here. Um, when Paul did that, you know it's a, 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 one of these judges, not a legionary commander or governor, because it's in Greece, and there weren't, there, Greece was not a province, so they wouldn't have had a governor. They didn't have any legions, so it would have been a legionary commander. So this would have been the, the uh, Roman judge that was uh, working there. Um, <clears throat> and then you uh, have, um, well, by the way, that, that decision that he made, just on, on a side note, was actually very big. Because by, by making an official judicial decision that Christianity was part of Judaism, that meant Christianity for a time could say there's court precedence for us to get all the liberties that the Jews have. Uh, so the Jews have been granted a number of freedoms. And because the Christianity was called the same thing as the Jews, it was granted that uh, by the court. And that actually helped Paul and his ministry a great deal. Uh, so once you've done one of these other things, legionary commander, governor, or judge, then you typically, the next thing you do is serve as counsel. Um, now in the Republic, counsel was, you know, the most powerful person that was there. It was, they had two councils uh, at any given time, uh, and that was kind of like president and vice president, except they were both equal. There was not one that was the president and then one of the vice president. It was just two equal councils. Uh, once you get to the empire, though, the emperor um, is the one who's clearly in charge and sometimes served as counsel, sometimes wasn't counsel, and he still was in charge. Uh, it's kind of like Putin over in Russia. It's like he holds office once in a while to try to legitimize things, but everyone knows he's been in control for the last 40 years. Uh, so something to that effect. Actually, how, how long has he been? 30, 20 years? Four presidents, they said. Four presidents. Mm -hmm. So almost 20 years then. Yeah. <clears throat> Just seems like 40. Mm -hmm. So the next order was the equestrian <coughs> order, uh, which we would think of as knights. So you have nobles, and then you have knights. Uh, originally, this was the idea that a the person who was the knight could afford to own a horse and supply his own uh, self with armor and a sword and so on and so forth. Uh, and so therefore he was um, uh, basically able to have one step up above the average soldier, uh, but eventually uh, became more where he had to actually own land and he had to have a minimum of 100,000 denarii uh, to be admitted to the Senate. You might remember from the sermon a couple weeks ago, um, a denarii is like about one day's wage. And so uh, 100,000 denarii means you are decently wealthy. Uh, to be able to, to serve in the equestrian order. The Roman military commanders um, could be promoted to equestrian when they retired. So if you were not a Roman citizen at all, uh, and you had come into, um, into the military, we'll see this a little bit, and when you're done, you can be granted citizenship. But if you had been a Roman citizen and you went into the legions, then when you, you, if you serve as a commander, you can get out and be an equestrian order even though you were not, you were just a plebe before. So that was one of the main ways that a lot of guys moved up socially uh, into the equestrian order during the Roman times. Uh, because of this, a number of sons of equestrians did obtain senatorial class, but there's also times when the sons of the senators that didn't get involved in politics and didn't want to spend that money, they actually became equestrians officially. Um, you say, well, why would they want to do that? Well, equestrians had less uh, social expectations. 
uh, and it allowed you to get into business uh, a lot more freely than if you were in the senatorial class, uh, just because of the political connections and so on and so forth. And so some who had no desire to get into politics, just wanted to go out and make a bunch of money, would switch to the equestrian order so they could actually have more money uh, than if they were in the senatorial class. Uh, and because of that, sometimes the equestrians actually, in reality, held more power than the senatorial class did because of the, the sway they had financially and what they had with trade and their interactions even with other nations because they would have huge uh, uh, companies over items that are being traded that they had more power than some senators did. Uh, the other positive about being an equestrian is you're less susceptible to the emperor's jealousy because once you're in the equestrian order, you can't, you know, you weren't a threat as much to try to become emperor. Uh, and uh, we didn't spend a whole lot of time on it, but you remember all the different times we went through when the emperors were changing, uh, they tended to take out all of their enemies' uh, um, supporters. And uh, then also you face no barriers. Uh, so like with Senate, eventually, as we said, in order for you to serve, you had to stay a certain closeness to Rome. Well, if you're an equestrian, you can be as far away from Rome as you want. Uh, and uh, so you could exercise commercial enterprises all the way out to the Middle East. You also had within the Roman Empire what was called municipal aristocracies. So this was the biggest in Greece. Each city had uh, their own city-state prior to you know, Rome coming in, and, and they had a, their, own, uh, their own senate, their own uh, um, group that was elected that would control what was in the, in the city. Uh, and so those that were the rulers of the city, uh, <clears throat> they were part of the municipal aristocracy. So you weren't a patristic class, you weren't technically an equestrian, because you weren't in an official Roman area, uh, but you were seen as kind of equal to an equestrian, and they were typically called decurions, uh, and uh, that usually was about a group of 100 uh, that were in that. Some cities were smaller and had only 30. Some were larger and had almost 500. Mm -hmm. This is what the senator, or sorry, the uh, Sanhedrin would have been seen as, and the members of the Sanhedrin uh, would have been seen as. And this is why you know it's possible that you know this week we're preaching on the rich young ruler, and it's like, what do you mean ruler? What does what does it mean that he's a ruler? Because he's not one of the kings and stuff in the area. Um, but it could be that he was like one of these where. Uh, he was on the Sanhedrin and was from a family that had uh, been in that class for a while, and so he was honored uh, mm -hmm. with that title. If you were on one of these municipal aristocracies, uh, it wasn't cheap. Uh, you A lot of the pro projects that happen in the city, you're paying for them. So, oh, we need a new aqueduct. Uh, we need to build it. We want to build a gymnasium. We want to build these different things that usually came... Uh, from those that were in these municipal aristocracies. But again, as, as we do today, you put their name on it in a nice big plaque and you uh, see those things. Uh, and so people would still actually give the money. Uh, they also helped maintain public order. So in Acts 16, uh, 20, uh, you'll see, um, actually, does somebody have a Bible? Just turn to Acts 16, 20 real quick. I'll see if I can beat you guys. Just read it if you get there before me. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. So this is, this is in uh, Philippi. And so Philippi was one of these Greek cities. So these magistrates that they're talking about is the group of people that would have been these municipal aristocracies uh, that are mentioned here. Uh, also, these municipal aristocracies, they were to provide the public entertainment, food in times of emergency and things like that. In a certain sense, you can look at them almost like our local governments today. You know, who, who puts on the fireworks show on the 4th of July? You know city puts all that together who has the parades and who does all that stuff that's that's them they have to do that of course they raise the money from from taxes and stuff um and these aristocracies they because of what they were they would have had taxes and stuff as well 
but there were still those that had to provide those things. Uh, so in essence, he had to pay for a lot of the influence. Plebeians, uh, plebes are just the name for the little guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is yeah. the, they're citizens of Rome still, um, but they aren't seen in any of these higher classes. And this probably was where the Apostle Paul was in, in his citizenship. Um, and so these are just Roman citizens. They, they belong to neither senatorial or equestrian orders. Uh, and Saul, uh, Paul, uh, received his citizenship by being born in Tarsus, which was a Roman colony. So because it was a Roman colony, he automatically just received his citizenship by birth. When he has the encounter with the centurion, uh, where he was about to be whipped, and he's like, you're going to whip a Roman citizen. And the centurion's like, oh, crud. But then he's like, well, you know, how'd you get your Roman citizenship? And uh, he tells him basically by birth. And he was able, in, the, in essence, by saying that, to trump the centurions because the centurion was receiving, he had received his by joining the, the military uh, and such. So, so yeah, so the, it's, uh, it's, you can see some of that social interaction happening in that mm -hmm. passage. You also had uh, a class called freedmen. Um, so freedmen were slaves turned employees, uh, and we would we would probably typically think more of a freedman as like the the owner let them go and then they go and they have nothing to anything to do with the owner anymore. They're off on their own doing their own business. Uh, what typically happened with the freedmen is there's actually an agreement between the owner and the slave. Um, and, uh, so the, the owner, instead of like making the, making the slave buy himself out and do manumission and such, they instead said, I'm going to give, give you, you're a very gifted individual. I'm going to give you this power and this authority and you're going to go here, uh, and you can run this business over here, but you're free to, to do that. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and then the, the they would keep that relationship going so that the owner still had somewhat of a financial support and the slave would still uh, be holding to them in certain ways. Um, when this free, when you became a freedman, if the person who freed you was a Roman, then you got Roman citizenship uh, by them freeing you. And then the children of the freedmen were able to enter the equestrian class uh, um, right off the bat. Now, because the, the, the freedmen, Again, this isn't just a, a freed slave This is a, 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 who bought their freedom. This is somebody who's had a specific agreement. Um, and so Felix, the governor of Judea, uh, that we read about in Acts 23, uh, he was a freedman of the imperial household. So he actually had pretty high class and, uh, and would have been seen as like an equestrian. Uh, and, uh, but he came and he... he did that job because he was thought to have certain skills and such and thought highly of by the imperial household so they freed him to go and do that task sort of thing uh and so you see uh that sort of um person i'm trying to think i believe the um in the antioch church there's also who else was the, was the free there? There was a gentleman, I believe, who was a servant in Herod's household uh, that might have been said to be a freedman. And so you kind of see, see that there. <clears throat> and then after you had the freedmen, you had uh, the slavery. In the ancient world, slavery was just a basic element of society. It was there. It was present everywhere. There was almost no society in the ancient times that did not have slavery. What is very different about the slavery in the ancient world from what we remember here in American history is that slavery in the ancient world was never about a single ethnicity or a single group of people uh, or a single race that, that was never the case. So when you saw slaves in the ancient world, they were just as diverse as everybody else everywhere. Um, in fact, even in America, that was the case when we started. Um, the, the development of uh, the African slave trade happened in America because of the fact that it was a continent on the other side of an ocean. And so what happened when we first started sending settlers here to the U.S. 
is they would have the settlers, they'd start to work the land, and then they would want to get servants to come and work the land for them. And when they would get servants that came that were European descent, they would get there and realize, I have this huge country to run away into and to go eke out a, a living and be totally fine and I can get by and I can communicate with people around me um, and, and I'll be fine and they would just run away. Uh, Native Americans that they would bring in uh, to, to be servants, they would just be like, we're done with this and then fade into the woods and go run away as well. The African slaves, when they came, they often intentionally put them in separate groups so they couldn't communicate with each other and then they did not have the language to be able to interact with all those of European descent and to figure that out. And so they were not prone to running away. So in the 1600s, there's actually a place where out of the 24,000 slaves in the US, 20,000 of them were not African. They were white or, or other European ethnicities. But because of the difficulty of getting people to stay and work the plantations and work the things, and the, the, the cotton fields and stuff in the South, uh, that, is, that is why it started driving this more direct uh, trade and the African uh, slave trade took off at a level it had not before in history. In the ancient world, we you just pulled slaves from the different places, uh, it, was, it was the same here or there, and, it, and you would have slaves from every nationality that was there. Because when you look at the sources of the slavery, one of the biggest sources was just gained through battle. So that could be a civil war. You capture a bunch of people in the civil war and then now they go and they're, they're servants because they fought mm -hmm. against you. Uh, you're fighting against the, the, the Gauls, you're fighting against the Germans, you're fighting against you know the Jews or the Syrians, you take them captive, then there's a source of slavery and they would go and they would be uh, sold. And that was probably one of the largest sources at that time. So it had nothing to do with an ethnicity. It had to do with whether you lost the battle. You did have those that um, would take captives uh, and there'd be pi piracy and brigandage. So on the sea, they would rob the ship. They would take the people captive and then sell the people for slaves. And there were some that actually um, just went out and kidnapped people. Uh, those sorts of people were seen as, as vile, and they are condemned specifically in Scripture. There's a place where it uh, condemns those that would go out and just kidnap somebody and sell them uh, as a slave. Um, another source of slavery was when they found an exposed child. So they did not have, uh, or they didn't do abortions as commonly back then. If the child was unwanted when it was born, it was put out in the field and left, and they walked away from it. Uh, and then you would take that child uh, and you would raise it up, but that would be somebody who would be like a servant in your home. So that was another source that they had. Um, the sale of a child or yourself or family members to pay debts. We just went through the, the unforgiving servant and he was told he had to pay a hundred, you know, 10,000 talents. And he's like, you can't. So he's, what was going to happen? He was going to be sold. His wife was going to be sold. His kids were all going to be sold to try to help uh, pay off that debt. And this was very common. When you became a major debtor back in that day, uh, they didn't have prisons to just hold debtors. They didn't do that. Uh, if you were in debt, you couldn't pay. They sold you, recovered their money as best they could from having sold you, and then now you are a slave uh, at that point. Uh, the other thing was condemnation in courts. So if you had done a crime, again, they weren't big on prisons. Uh, to just hold you there. Uh, <coughs> instead, you were sent to places. Now, this sort of slavery <clears throat> was typically the worst. So if you, if you were a slave from crime, and then the, the prisoner of war was also one of the worst, depending on who, who you were. Like if you were one of the soldiers who had been fighting and you were young and strong, uh, and especially if they were really ticked at how well you did and you killed a bunch of their friends, then you were sent off to the salt mines or you were sent off to the you know the iron mines you had to go do mining you had to do very wretched uh strong physical labor uh that you didn't last very long many of the jews uh who were captured um during the time of of the jewish war with rome were taken by by nero at the beginning and sent to corinth to dig the corinth canal so that corinthian canal that is there today was started, they did not 
finish it by any means, but they had started work on it using the Jewish labor from having been captured. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're condemned or you're a prisoner of war, that's where you had a lot of the hard labor. Uh, the other way was if uh, you were born a slave, uh, a, a, the child of, of, of a slave took the condition of their mother, not the condition of their father. And there's a, unfortunately obvious reasons why that was the case. Uh, and so that was another source. Now when you see this, you would realize we had slaves from all different ethnicities, all different backgrounds. Uh, there wasn't a, a, a move, like what, what you began to see in America that was so wretched was uh, this, this seeing the slavery as a, you know, all that a race was fit for and seeing that race uh, as, as only qualified for this. I mean, there's, there's a letter that um, you read from Thomas, I read it from, it's from Thomas Jefferson to, and I wish I could remember his name, it was a, um, it was a black astronomer who was also, he was writing a uh, almanac as well. And so he's writing this almanac and, and he shows it, Thomas Jefferson sees it and he comes back and he's like, you know, you know, what a credit and what a shock that someone from your race can do this. It's terrible. It's like, you know, just based on that, we, we, we were shocked you, you can do this. And that's the one who wrote, all men are created equal, <laughs> you know, or help to do that. So it's like, it's like the, we, we got to a point in that, in that stage of our, of our history um, where there was a belief behind slavery that wasn't present in the ancient world. Uh, and it resulted in, in great injustices against just certain people. Now, in the ancient world, with the slavery coming from this type of, of background, a lot of times there was a justness to it. In other words, prisoner of war, you couldn't pay your debts, you had done a great crime, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, there was kind of like a justice to it where you had actually earned that state. But to just sit there and say, no, you, you've earned that state because of how you were born is completely wrong, although you do have some of that uh, here as well. This, when the Bible then talks about slaves, so when in the New Testament you're dealing with the issue of, you know, Paul saying, you know, wives, submit to your husbands, children, submit to your parents, slaves, submit to your masters, and you're like, well, why isn't he all up in arms with, to take down slavery and just say it's wicked and sinful? Because at that time, it was, it was actually a part of society where you accomplish justice because they didn't throw people into prisons and keep them there. It was you had to go into these circumstances and pay debts. And there were legal ways that you could then work and pay off a debt and earn the money and be freed and get many mission and stuff was there. There was, uh, as time, earlier on, there was less protection for any slaves. Later on in Roman history, there was a lot more protection for slaves. And what you see in the Old Testament, for instance, is some of the most protective laws for slaves uh, and, and value slaves higher than any of the culture around it. Uh, but people are mad because it, just because it doesn't uh, straightforward rebuke slavery. But to do that is to take our modern sensibilities with all that's developed over time and the history and, and, the, and the, the depth of depravity that human slavery hit in America by making it just a single race uh, mm -hmm. and such, that, that that wasn't present in the ancient world's version of slavery. Uh, and so we have to be careful not to take all that back and say the Bible was approving of that because uh, it never would have approved of, of what was happening uh, here in the U.S. in that fashion. So at that time, if, if somebody was needing to have a servant, you would be able to purchase them from a slave dealer. Uh, but you also would inherit slaves uh, when you inherited the estate from your parents. Uh, and a lot of that is the case. And in fact, when you look at um, a lot of stuff in the, in the U.S. history, this is one of those big, big controversies because some, uh, some people inherited the slaves. They were actually standing against slavery. And then their parents died and they inherited them. And it became this big thing. Well, you own slaves. And it's like, you know, but then you're like, well, just, just you know, just, you know, get rid of them. But like, where are they going to go to? What are they going to, what are they going to do for the job? How are you, are they going to take care of it? Who's going to, who's going to hire them? And so it wasn't always just that easy to just get rid of them. It wasn't always the nicest thing to get rid of them. 
Uh, instead, you know, if you if you took them in and treated them really well and made them like family, that was better than throwing them out and go fend for yourself in a world that's going to persecute you because of who you are. Uh, and so it's more complex often than, than we think when that inheriting uh, came through. Uh, also, uh, when the slave was, it was born within the household, we said it took the status of the mother, so that was another way that, that they would acquire them. A lot of times during uh, this period, you had a number of servants um, that uh, actually did enjoy the, the life that they had and actually had a nicer life than they ever would have otherwise had because they were made a servant in a home that was much nicer than they could have ever attained to <coughs> where they were. Uh, and this happens a lot. In, uh, um, in the Old Testament, this is where it's, the slave is given the opportunity, if they want, to have their ear pierced and to demonstrate, I, I want to be with my, my master forever. <laughs> and then you're like, well, why, you know, why would you ever do that? And it seems so contrary to anything we could think of today in our culture. Well, part of that is because we don't know how hard it was to get by if you weren't a slave and you were just totally free. Uh, back in this day, a, a complete free person was, uh, was not valued for a worker. So it was hard for you to get work because if you, uh, um, a, a slave, you had the ability to you know, discipline, you had the ability to you know, pay and all that other stuff and, and control and legal ramifications if they didn't. The free man would come and he'd say, do this work, oh, halfway through the day, forget it and walk away. And what could you do? You couldn't do anything. And so they, they didn't value you uh, going and getting just that free labor. Uh, this is why the, the, um, the prodigal son goes out and all that he can find to do is, you know, feeding the pigs and these things that no one really cares about. Uh, because, and, and then what does he say? It would be better for me to be a slave in my father's house than to be in the circumstance where I can't even uh, provide for myself. Uh, and so it, you can imagine if you get brought into a family, the family treats you well, treats you like their, their own, and you, they live in wealth, and be, with the wealth that they, they have, you then live in nicer conditions than you otherwise would have. And if they were to suddenly give you your freedom, you'd be set loose in a city and a culture that would persecute you and not give you a job and not, not do anything. So you can see why they'd be like, I'll, I'll stay a, a slave. Uh, and so in that sense, you do see some that uh, did well within the role uh, of a slave. Uh, no matter what, though, um, there were definitely forms of slavery that were wretched and horrible. Um, but you see, you do actually do see a number of servants uh, that are happier than what you would think in the Roman times. <clears throat> now, in the history books, this is what we read. So what's their status? So they're a thing. So Aristotle refers to them as living property. Uh, and uh, the Nicomachean Ethics states the slave is a living tool and the tool a lifeless slave. Uh, <clears throat> now, some of these definitions seem to go, oh, look, they were you know, seen as, as less human because they were seen as property. But again, you have to be careful on that because that's taking a lot of our modern ideas of freedom and reading it back into that and, and our modern ideas of, of humanity and reading it back into that <clears throat> because we feel that you're if you if you aren't free you're less than human and to say your property is just automatically bad and one of the reasons why i caution against having that perspective is it says in the old testament it refers to the slaves and it says in the law that the slave is their property and what it is we, we think well property means what well it means i can just throw it away <laughs> how many of you guys go home and just throw your property away what do you guys do with your property? Take care of it. Take out. care of it. Does anyone go home and say, well, my car is just my property, so I'm just going to kick it. I'm just going to be, what do you do with your car because it's your property? Take care of it. You take care of it. What do you do with your home because it's your property? You take care of it. You maintain it. You don't, you don't want to lose it because it, you know, here's this investment, here's all that stuff that's there, and you're going to take care of it. 
that's an aspect that's that's sometimes forgotten. And I don't say this to say you know you know slavery is a good thing. I'm saying when you when you it, we read a statement in the Bible that this person was property, and we automatically think that that means they're junk. It's like no, it's the opposite. It meant that that person is responsible to take care of them. So like you know today we have laws that if you have a dog, then and you don't take care of the dog. Out of animal cruelty laws, you can you can be disciplined because you own that dog. You're the owner of that dog. That dog is your property. So therefore, you must take care of it, or we will hold you accountable. So in that sense, when the when they're talking about the the property and, and when a scripture talks about it being the property, it's not trying to devalue. It's trying to say responsibility. You are responsible to take care of this. You are responsible to feed them. You are responsible to clothe them. You're responsible to house them. And, and, and so it's not a, a, uh, a belittling your less than human state. It's just stating the relationship because yes, okay, you, you, you went and, and to, cause this person was in debt, uh, they had to be sold. So you bought them. You can't then buy them and just neglect them. You can't buy them and just never take care of them. They're your property. You have to take care of them. They're, they're yours uh, to do that with. And this is where one of the things about us and the Lord being a slave to the Lord is that he takes care of us. We are his property. Uh, and I'll tell you, I would, I would rather be a slave to a wonderful, benevolent Lord who brought me in and shared all of his wealth with me and took me in his family than to be free and be left to my own devices and starving and everything else like that. Uh, now, I just made a very non-American statement, maybe by some people, uh, because it's what is it? Give me liberty or give me yeah. death? Something like that. But that's actually showing how some of those values that have become ingrained in us aren't actually there in Scripture. Liberty is, is not the most important thing. My walk with the Lord and loving Him and, and being a slave to Him as a master who cares for me and loves me is actually uh, far better than give me liberty or give me death. Hmm. So... Um, also with the slaves, they had, uh, no legal rights. Um, with that, it doesn't mean there weren't any legal protections. They just didn't have the legal rights. Like they couldn't go to court. Uh, um, and, uh, um, and we'll, well, we'll see that in just a second. Uh, they were subject to the absolute power of the master. So the master did have, uh, you know, total control over their lives, depending on the location uh, depended on whether the master could be held accountable to various things for the slave's life. For instance, uh, in Scripture, if if the master uh, you know were to to injure or kill the slave, he it was very clear that he was still to be stoned to death if he killed the slave. Uh, this it's not like that was lesser, um, uh, but there was the ability to discipline using physical corporal punishment. There was the ability to do that. Uh, which is why you would say they were subject to the absolute power of the master. So the rights denied to slaves. You couldn't be your own legal representation in court. Uh, does not mean someone else couldn't represent you, but you can't function that way yourself. Um, there was the, You were denied the protection against illegal seizure. What does that mean? Well, it means that your master could walk into your living quarters and search and seize anything in it he wanted because it was all in his land, his property, and so on and so forth. Uh, so there wasn't a protection so that the master couldn't come in and do that. Um, you were denied the right to work where you pleased. You had to work where you were told. Uh, and you were denied the freedom of movement in the sense that you couldn't just go wherever you wanted, whenever you wanted. You had to have permission uh, from the master uh, to do that. The conditions of how nice you lived depended on your master. Uh, and there are many servants mentioned uh, that are very happy and living in much better circumstances than you and I are right now <laughs> as they serve their masters in these gorgeous villas and so on and so forth. Uh, and yet there are others that lived in horrible circumstances that were far worse than, than what we ever endured. Um, but I would dare say you can say the same thing about everybody's job situation nowadays. Uh, there are some that have fantastic job situations. There are some that don't. And think about this, because... You, being an employee, uh, when you're when you're functioning as an employee, 
that employer has no reason really to make sure you're staying healthy, make sure you're well fed, make sure you're well clothed and so on and so forth, except for what they want to benefit their company. Uh, well, we want you to be healthy. Why? Because your health insurance is costing us too much, uh, but not because they want to just take care of you. Uh, and then a, an employee, uh, an employer can fire you on the spot and you're just left. Uh, and uh, so that wasn't always the case with the issue of slavery because there were certain legal things that they had to do and so on and so forth. Um, daily life often was better uh, than the legal theory. So in other words, yes, legally you didn't have all this representation, but you often would have uh, your owner. So let's say there was an, an issue between you as a, as a slave and somebody in the village as you were going out to buy things for the household and something happens, your owner would be there with a the legal representation. They would take care of all those things for you and cover those things uh, for you. Uh, some effort was also made during the early empire to lessen a master's absolute control. Big part of that was thanks to Spartacus and some of those other slave revolts that occurred uh, where they realized we have a large number of slaves in the Roman Empire, enough that if they do rebel, we're in deep trouble, so we need to help keep them happier. And so there was an overarching, broad desire to keep the, the life of a slave uh, more uh, livable uh, to prevent that kind of slave revolt. And that actually was one of the greatest fears of the Roman Empire was the slave revolt, especially after Spartacus. Mm. So the type of work the slaves did, everything from imperial slaves uh, to mine workers. So an imperial slave, you would not even look at it as like you're the slave at all. I mean, they were right-hand man to an emperor and trusted and, and lived an opulent life. Uh, mine workers, you, you were quite literally worked to death in the mines. Uh, if, they do, if they wanted to feed you, they feed you, they do all these other things, they just work you, and if you died, oh well, they'll go get more. Uh, so that was horrible. You had temple slaves, uh, so th they would be sold to the temple, and, the, and basically they were the ones that would care for all of the cleaning and the caring and the maintaining of the building and so on and so forth, uh, which again, depending on who the master is, could be a positive thing or a negative thing. Uh, there were slaves that were purchased to be teachers and tutors, um, I know that's how some of our teachers and tutors feel nowadays. <laughs> but, uh, uh, um, but they, I mean, that, that was their role. They came into the house. Um, and, uh, and the thing about the thing about this, what makes it different is if you were purchased to be, you know, the, the tutor or the, or the teacher, they, in other words, paid an upfront price and you came in and they didn't pay you a paycheck. You came in and they fed you, they housed you, they clothed you, they this, and you you would get a certain allotment from them uh, still to go and spend and so on and so forth, uh, but you didn't have the freedom to just up and leave and, and so on and so forth. But within that, you could earn money toward paying off what they paid to buy you, and you could have manumission and be free. Um, but many of them, they came in, they were the teachers, and they were glad that they didn't have to go try to establish their own school and try to buy their own house and try to go. They, they were glad to have a place to stay and to live and to be under a roof. Um, you, they bought slaves that were gifted for property management and they used them to, to manage their properties. Uh, child care, you'd bring somebody in like nannying and, and stuff like that. Uh, the um, slaves of the government did what is now civil service, uh, even at high levels. So you know, everything from uh, um, firemen to policemen to uh, um, if you were uh, um, taking care of maintaining the roads, your things like that. So those were, those were often done by slaves that the government had, had purchased and you did civil service. Hmm. Um, and then, like I said, here, the imperial slaves were actually proud of their status uh, and, uh, and glad to be that. In the comparison to the freedmen, the freedmen did not like the accountability to another man and were therefore thought to be untrustworthy. So as you know, when it came down to what you what you wanted, the freedmen had the harder time finding work and finding the job. Because um, 
uh, there was a reason they were free and you didn't want to have to deal with that hassle. The slave was preferred then because they knew that he could be trusted to follow instructions. Now, uh, typically a slave would receive uh, the uh, peculium. Uh, this is money or property that legally remained the possession of the master but was available to the slave for their own use. Uh, and they, the slave could save this and buy their freedom. So the reason why it legally remains the property of, uh, of the slave is, let's say, the, the slave dies, who inherits it? The master does. Uh, and if the slave is saving it up and so on and so forth, and the slave um, you know, murders one of the family members or, or kills one of their animals, and, and as a result, the, the relationship is... Uh, is cut off or, or something for that reason, uh, that money legally goes to the master. Uh, it does not mean, in essence, that the slave had to go and ask the master every time he wanted to get money. It was just, it was in the possession of the slave, uh, but uh, the, um, the owner legally inherited it if anything happened to them. So the slave could take that money, save it up, and eventually buy their freedom which is what we call manumission. Uh, if a slave wanted to do that, they, if they had the right amount of money, there was a mediator that they could hire and, and they would mediate between them and the owner uh, and work to do that. So there was protection so that the owner couldn't just say, no, no, no. It's like they, if he had the money and you'd earned it, um, that was there. But the most frequent way that a slave attained freedom is the master would just grant it. Um, and this was especially common that they would grant the freedom in their will. So when they died, the person became a freedman, uh, and, and they were then free to, to go. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how the slavery was back in that day. A little bit different than what we uh, think of more close to our own time. So citizenship... Uh, what did it mean to be a Roman citizen? So all these were different ways that um, a slave, if you were a slave in a uh, in the, the a Roman citizen's house and you were freed, you were often considered to be then a citizen. Um, so <clears throat> originally, citizenship was accompanied with political responsibility. So when it was in Rome and you were given Roman citizenship and Rome was just a small colony, then, then you have... Uh, um, a certain level of, okay, we have to take care, we have to vote, we have to this, and so on and so forth. Like you and I, it's part of our citizenship duty to vote and participate in all of those things. Uh, eventually, as the emperor's empire spread and they had more Roman colonies, they started to give Roman citizenship uh, more as a, um, just kind of an honor and to express unity and build unity with the, in the empire not so much to get everybody involved in the civic duty of a citizen and start voting uh, for everything. Um, the ways to obtain citizenship, you had uh, birth to citizen parents, which is uh, probably what Paul had, and there would be birth certificate to that effect. We said the freed slave of a citizen. Uh, it could be given as a favor for special service to the empire. That may have also been how Paul's family got it. Uh, King Herod... Um, his father, uh, Antipater, if you remember, went and saved uh, um, Caesar from uh, the fight he was having with uh, Ptolemy in Egypt. And when he did that, he was granted citizenship in Rome, as was Herod and so on and so forth. So Herod was a Roman citizen. Uh, Antipater was a Ro Roman citizen and such. Uh, if you enlisted in the legions, you became a citizen. Uh, and if you're discharged from service in the auxiliaries which we're going to talk in a second about the auxiliaries. Um, there's a difference between the legions and the auxiliaries. Basically, auxiliary would be you were a group of Jews that were put together to, to be soldiers that would work with the Roman soldiers, but you weren't an actual Roman legion. And if you served in the auxiliaries, when you got out of the auxiliaries, you became a citizen. Hmm. So, what were the privileges and advantages? Um... You could vote in the elections, but you had to be in Rome to do that, so not everybody did that. Uh, and uh, some citizenship w ended up being granted eventually without the right to vote, because again, it was just being given to bring unity. Um, 
one of the biggest things, and we see this one being made use of in Scripture, is the freedom from degrading forms of uh, punishment. Uh, and if there was a, uh, when, when, Paul, when Paul is about ready to be whipped here, and as well in Philippi, he makes use of this uh, citizenship. In Philippi, the interesting thing is, is that they actually go ahead and beat him and imprison him without any sort of uh, trial. And it's not until the next morning that they find out he's a Roman citizen. And so then they come, if, you're, if you remember from the story, so Paul is, is you know, the Philippian jailer. Uh, they go and they eat at his house, uh, but then they kind of go back to the jail. And then when the, when the Philippian jailer informs the people there in Philippi he's a Roman citizen, they get very scared that they're going to come under legal ramifications for having done to Paul what they did. And so they send a messenger and said, just tell him he's free, he can go. But what does Paul do? Mm -hmm. He's, no, you come here and you tell me to my face, which is kind of an interesting thing to see with him. Now, why would he do that? Because by them coming to his face and saying that, as he leaves Philippi, he'd only been able to be there about four weeks, he just bought their protection. They do anything to that church in Philippi, he'll come back and sue them because they, they violated his citizenship. So you see this freedom from the degrading form of punishment actually being used to further the gospel there. Uh, the right of appeal to Rome. So this right of appeal, so you're exempt from indigenous local governments. Um, for example, something a modern equivalent to this, whenever our armed forces go into a foreign country, there is a great deal of negotiating that goes about about legal ramifications of an act of a U.S. soldier. When I was in Korea, I had a card that I had to carry around with me everywhere. I had a bunch of different information. But if I did any sort of crime or got accused of any sort of crime, they couldn't arrest me. Korean police couldn't arrest me. They had to hold me until a U.S. military uh, police came. They could arrest me. And taking so there was an agreement between the government saying, you know, you don't get to punish our soldiers, we get to punish our soldiers, uh, and so you can't do that. So similarly here, if you are a Roman citizen and you happen to be in a, uh, a foreign country that was under the Roman uh, thing, so like in here's Paul, he's in Jerusalem, and uh, and he comes under the the condemnation of the Sanhedrin, he can appeal to Caesar, and by his appealing to Caesar, it nullifies anything that that indigenous uh, group wants to do. So when you wonder why did he appeal to Caesar, you know, because he would have been set free. And maybe he shouldn't have appealed to Caesar because he ended up, you hear from Felix and, and Festus and them, oh, we, we could have set him free. No, because if they set him free, he was going to get killed. The moment he, he got set free, he had, you know, 30, 40 men who had vowed not to eat food till he was dead. And if they set him free, he was a goner. And so when he appeals to Rome, it means that, that they don't have to release him to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin's claim on him is gone the moment he appeals to Caesar. And they, and they can't go after him. Uh, and then also exempt from Roman governors, which even Felix, and which is why when he says this to Felix and Festus, they can do nothing about it. They can't go, no, you can't. It's like, nope, you, once you've... Uh, uh, claim to see, appeal to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. That's what's going to have to happen because uh, they couldn't do anything about it. And so you see this being used twice uh, in the book of Acts. Now, now we get into a little bit of the social relationships. Um, so those are kind of the, the within society, those were the, the different levels of, of class that you would have, slaves, freedmen, and so on and so forth. Citizens was part of that as well. You're a citizen or you're not. Here you have the uh, social relationships with the patron-client relationship. Uh, this is something that exists still somewhat today, but not nearly as uh, common as it was in Rome. So the client would often... Um, basically, this is... I'm trying to think of a, of a good Personal one. Personal trainer. What's that? Your personal trainer, your hairdresser. That's, this is way, way more than that. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the only word that keeps coming to my mind is not appropriate per se. <laughs> this is your sugar daddy. This is like the, 
This is the one who's there who pays for everything for you. You have that relationship with them. Uh, and then you need money, you need to go here, you need to go do this, you need to go do that, and that person pays it for you. They pay for your education. They, if you're on that cursus honorum, they, they, they're financing that all the way up. Uh, and there is, uh, um, and you're like, why would somebody do that? Why would you have that? Well, one, the power you get to have. If that person ends up getting into a position of power and a position of influence, then you have influence over them. And you have credit uh, for some of those things. Uh, this is also tied into a not so pleasant relationship uh, between an older male and a younger male that we won't go into detail right now about. Uh, but it's not a, a very moral relationship. Uh, but that factored into some of it as well um, on occasion. Uh, but it was actually just very typical that those that had money uh, would find would find ways, in a sense, to use that in a way to affect society the way they want to. Um, interestingly, in the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, there's a kind of a parable, a little bit like this, where it talks about uh, a tree that has a uh, grapevine growing on it, and it's used as a parable as Christ talks to uh, um, Hermas. Uh, he's, he's, it's used as a parable of how um, there are those that have the means, like the, the person who's financially rich is like the tree, um, and so they have the means that God has blessed them with to be, to be strong and to stand without, without fear, um, but then they support the person who's bearing the fruit. So it's like the rich person who's the patron of the people who are ministering, uh, and so whether it be missionary or whatever, he, here's the patron paying the money, here's the person bearing the fruit, and it's this inseparable relationship you know, that God brought together. So you can see still, even in the Separate of Hermas, which is still a very Roman Latin work, uh, that, that idea of the patron-client relationship. So financial and legal help flowed down, honor, service, and respect flowed up. Uh, and so there are different ways that you would serve their interests in what they were, what you were doing, so on and so forth. Now, this, this, you know, in our politics today, we have donors that are really big. Why are they giving all that money to these political people? Because they want to have influence. And so mm -hmm. it's not unlike that. It just takes a little bit of different structure. And this was far more deep everywhere in the culture. Um, and actually within the church, this is a big thing. Uh, and so we sit down and we talk about like tithing and so on, different things like that in the church. There were very wealthy people within the church who just took care of certain things in the church often in, the, in that time. Uh, when you have um, Lydia, Lydia was probably kind of the patron client with the church. She it was her house. She probably financed a lot of what was happening in the church and paid for a lot of those things going on. Uh, and uh, but for her, it wasn't because she wanted all the honor and stuff. It was just she she did that. But it was that would have been a very common way for things to happen in that day, uh, and not unusual for her to just finance uh, many of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was there were people that financed Paul, uh, Jesus in his ministry. He walked around. It talks about the women that were there uh, with him and how they actually provided a lot of the the funds. And so there were very wealthy women that probably uh, had a lot to do with financing all of Jesus' food and ministry and everything while he was in Galilee. And part of that was in this idea of the patron-client relationship where they have the money and the means, and so they're, they're helping uh, to do that. Um, so different examples of how this would come about. The, the, the master freedman thing where I said there's kind of like a contract there. It's like you're being, you're, you're freed, and, and, but you're now, I'm supporting what you're doing in your adventure, but there's stuff that comes back to me out of that, and a benefit that comes back. Um, the rich and the poor. So sometimes uh, a rich person just saw potential in somebody who was poor, saw potential in someone that wasn't able to, to uh, get by. And so they would step in and they'd say, I'll, you know, I'll pay for the things and I'll, I'll bring you in. But then there again was that idea of the kickback of the relationship and the benefiting them uh, in return. The generals and, and conquered peoples, uh, there's some ways that this was kind of there in the fact of, you know, a general would come in and there he would often be very beneficial toward the people that he was, he was around in the desire that that would then bring the submission and, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, where do you see this in scripture? Anyone remember? There's a centurion whose child is brought to Jesus. Yeah. The Jews come and advocate on behalf of the centurion because he built their synagogue. So you see the centurion having given this beneficial, like, why, why did a centurion build a Jewish synagogue? It's this understanding within the Roman culture that patron clients, like, I, I'm going to benefit, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to help you guys, but then you have that return of submitting, and then here he has this issue, and you see how the Jews advocate for him with Jesus, who is Jewish, and he had been the patron of, of that synagogue. Uh, so you see that stuff, you know, happening uh, in scripture and then the aristocrats and a collegia uh, or groups so in other words um, you know you might just say clubs <laughs> you, you have people that sponsor a club and they sponsor this and, and uh, you know the club needed that in order to to be able to accomplish things now today what you typically have is people who want to do these things and they have to go and raise funds they do fundraising uh, this is what this is, is it, it, in the Roman world, it was almost more on the wealthier person's owners to go and find the place they wanted to put their funds than it was for the other people to go and try to find people to give them the funds. But that all happened. They, they, you definitely had people seeking to have the patron and, and, and the client. Uh, so the client would go to seek the patron. Patron would also, also seek the client. Uh, but this, the key thing is this was a... Uh, extremely common thing this quote that you have from Ferguson everyone from slave to aristocrat felt bound to display respect to someone more powerful than himself up to the emperor the interactions between patrons and clients and between members of a household represent the principal vertical relationship in society so this patron client relationship saturated everything of that time then to get us into our next section he says friendship was the ideal horizontal relationship. So <clears throat> friendship, uh, what I want to distinguish here is it's not romantic marriage that is the ideal and most important horizontal relationship. Uh, and while some marriages may have been marriages of friends, marriage is seen at this time as primarily a way to have legitimate heirs. <laughs> A way for you to, you know, you have the, the marriage, because marriage at this time is not typically go marry whoever you want, uh, although that most certainly did happen. Uh, but more often it is, this is arranged by your parents with the person who is going to be the best connection for the family. And you're, you're marrying to benefit the family. So that's why, you, you know, the whole, you know, this person's high class, this person has a lot of money. Well, how did they get ahead of the whole they married? Do they care if they wanted to get married? No, they just, you're going to marry because this is what's good for the family and, and everything else. Um, and, uh, and in some ways, to be honest with you, uh, their marriages probably weren't any worse off than ours were. I always think that arranged marriages have a head start because all of us that choose our spouse eventually find out that, okay, maybe I don't know if I made the right choice. And, and, oh <laughs> Yeah, come on. <laughs> but you get you get to a certain point, and what you realize is you have to just choose to love them. You have to just choose to love them, and then you and you're able to do that. Whereas the arranged marriage starts there. The arranged marriage just starts with I have to just choose to love this person uh, for who they are. There wasn't all the romantic expectation that can sometimes then be disappointed and create baggage and so on and so forth. Yes. So concubines were they play toys for like Solomon, or were they, were they servants that had? things to do. I, I'm yeah. being serious. I yeah, don't no, know. No, uh, concubine is just a word. It's, it's a word used for an illegitimate marriage more often than not. So in other words, it, it just means sleeping together. That's all concubine means. Con is with cubes, cub, cubine or cubescence is to sleep. Okay. So, so um, these two people are, are sleeping together. There were laws within Rome, as we're going to see in, the, in another lesson, where if you were living together for a year, by the time that year was done, you're married. There, there was no marriage, um, wedding, nothing like that. You're just you're married because you've been together. So, like, say after a year of being together, you decide to split up. That woman had the same rights as a wife uh, to finances and so on and so forth. Um, but a concubine, in essence, is somebody who where the marriage is not approved by the parents, 
not legally binding so that they can inherit from that family. And so, um, so in essence, the children are not legitimate heirs to the fortune of the family. Uh, and this is, this is like the, um, you know, not to use TV, but um, in Downton's Abbey, which is, I, I happen to be watching it, uh, <laughs> you have one of the daughters who marries the chauffeur. Well, parents weren't okay with her marrying the chauffeur. Uh, is way too low of a marriage, and so on and so forth. And so they have to go off to Ireland, and they live in Ireland. Uh, and he does say, you know, well, I don't know if any money will be coming out of that. Well, money may go to hell if it's their daughter, but that child, unless they make a specific act, that child is not going to qualify to inherit anything from that estate. They can't. So in some senses, that's what a concubine was. Uh, so if you went out and just found out who you were romantically in love with and married them and said, the heck with you, mom and dad? Yeah, you, you forfeited a lot. Uh, but that's a concubine. Uh, and so, you know, like when you get to the you know, Old Testament and somebody's going along and it's, you know, like Levi with his concubine, it's just it wasn't a legitimate marriage at that time. Um, however, that did also mean that if you had a guy who was legitimately married to somebody and also had taken on somebody else to have a relationship with them, that also would be a concubine. Uh, but that would mean this concubine, any children born to the concubine or a second wife would not have any inheritance, but the legitimate wife would, uh, her children would. And so you don't, because the morals are different, so what we're gonna see is that um, that concept of not having a relationship with somebody outside of marriage was not the same in the ancient world. It was almost expected that, you, that they had that other relationship uh, and wives often even knew about it. Uh, so the idea of like the marriage being this romantic, deep, intimate oneness, that, that wasn't there uh, in the same way in the ancient world. It was there, but not well, but the same again, way. in the ancient world, there was a prophet that was married to a prostitute. Mm -hmm. I Hosea. can't think of the name, but... Hosea. Yeah. 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 I mean... He was told to go. Yeah. yeah, he was told by God. Yeah, he was told by God to, to, to marry her. I mean, but you take, for instance, Gideon. Um, <clears throat> is it Gideon I'm thinking of? Because Gideon does actually have, a, Gideon has a concubine, but the, um, uh, the one I'm trying to think of is, <clears throat> no, the, I think it's the Amalekites are born from a concubine of Esau kind of thing. And so... But he had these many legitimate wives where there was arrangements with parents and so on and so forth. And then, then here was the one that he, he had taken on as a, as a wife, but just out of his own desire to have that. And so she was considered a concubine. But it doesn't mean he's starting a harem. That's the biggest thing you've got to be careful of. And Solomon was going against um, God's law in Deuteronomy because he did leave. He did tell Moses a thing for a king should not have too many wives. Yep. Well, he definitely went against that. Because he wouldn't be able to... Yeah. Um, give them the attention and whatnot that they need. Not just, you cared about their um, social attention, not just um, their mm -hmm. property. Yep. You cared and about the, the um, wives having enough attention from their husband. So a king shouldn't have too many wives. And they were supposed to keep that law with them all the time, the kings, and read it every night. Yep. The um, a big part of it at that time too was the not wanting them to intermarry, and the king especially would have made treaties by intermarrying with other nations, and God not wanting them to intermarry with the other nations and and such like that. Uh, and what you what you basically what you basically see when you like when you say Solomon had you know seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines is that seven hundred of those marriages were official marriages with this prince here or this princess here, this princess here with the king and like an officially done marriage, 300 of those were, you know, unofficial. Uh, but why can you count them? It's just because it's still, in the, it's still an agreement between them and he's still obligated. He, that, that's the idea is that if, if a man took a woman and is just living with her, you know, nowadays you can do that without any obligation. And that's why I, I think it's almost funny that we think that we're more liberated today. Because like, you, you can sleep with a woman for four or five years, live with her for four or five years, leave her and have no obligation to her whatsoever. And, uh, you know, or very little obligation. Whereas back then, once you had been together that long, 
you're you're officially married, you're a concubine, and then you have protection, and there's legal stuff that's there. So it's like, I don't know. Uh, the, yeah. Wait, wait, wasn't uh, Solomon's first wife an Egyptian? Your woman, girl, Pharaoh's daughter. His, his. I don't know if it was his first wife, but his primary wife yeah. was the Pharaoh's daughter. Other kings were giving him wives as yep. gifts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, understand that's how they made the treaties back then. That's how they made treaties. They. Here you go, here you go, here you go, and and, uh, and so that was that was very common. So. At, at um, Sarah's request, Abraham took a servant's girl, yes. which produced Ishmael. I mean, when you look at the consequences, that didn't work out very well for him either. Yeah, no, I mean, no, it didn't. Um, I mean, you look at, I mean, but what, what, what that does show, that as well as what you have with um, Rachel and... Um, Leah giving their servants and so on and so forth. The ancient world did not have the, the romantic ideas we have today. Uh, those romantic ideas uh, came out more during the romantic period of Western cultural history in the 16, 1700s that, you know, the husband and wife is just this, you know, super strong, romantic, passionate. You have to find the one that you want and that you have these desires for and you're the best one, you gotta follow your heart. <laughs> All that stuff comes out in the Romantic period following certain philosophies about humanity that um, that may not actually be fully true. That you know we can trust our heart, but our heart is good and, and not selfish and so on and so forth. Uh, and a lot of that romanticism has so affected our ideas that we go back here to an ancient world and we see you know a Roman wife who is married to a guy and she knows that he's going off to this party and there's another woman at this party and she's aware of that and that's happening. I'm not saying she's liking it, but she's, she would actually walk out and be like, that's fine, but I'm the real wife. I'm the one that's legitimate. You're nothing but a prostitute. And so why do I worry about it? But there was no sense of like, how does he do that? It was that, that romantic oneness uh, that, that we often have today was not present in the ancient world. So a lot of their practices look so foreign to us and like, how could that even be the case? Um, but even, you know, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who is a professor out at um, Telvit. He's from India and he had a friend of his that he grew up with who married a girl and then she's like, hey, can you marry my friend too? Because, you know, we want to be together. And then they both asked him to marry a third girl so that she could kind of take care of the kids. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the two of them went out and had fun, and 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 the guy did. He had three you know, houses for his different wives, and and so on and so forth. And that and and you, I sit there. I'm like, what? Like how? Who? Where? You know? Uh, and uh, and it's just different. It's a very Even different thing. Even in the Quran, it says that they have to do the same for each wife and treat each wife yep. the same equally. Yep. And and really, I mean the. The, the reason why I bring this up, uh, and we'll, is to move on here, is that in the Roman world then, marriage, that marriage romantic relationship, boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, was not the primary horizontal relationship. Uh, the primary horizontal relationship was friendship. So you would have this friend that was your close, you know, closer than a bosom brother, that is who you're with, and you did everything together with them. Uh, and that actually trumped the marriage relationship often, uh, but marriage was seen very different back then. Uh, and so within this friendship, you would have um, uh, uh, even common property, you know, the, this idea of sharing one's mind and soul, uh, sharing troubles and sacrificing for each other's behalf. And the, the one that from scripture that comes most close to this is not from the Roman uh, time, but when it says, you know, David and Jonathan had a love that exceeded that of the love of a man for a woman. It's like that was kind of what you're seeing here is that that deep friendship of I'll go and die for you was the primary and most celebrated relationship, not the marriage uh, relationship. Uh, and that's why you have entire treaties on, from philosophers on friendship and not so much on the marriage. Uh, now, if you find that friendship with your spouse, great. Uh, they would have been fine with that, but it was more often with somebody who is of the same sex and this deep, intimate friendship that was there uh, that occurred. And, that, and the interesting part of that is, you know, even like today, um, 
you know, when you, when you sit down and you say, you know, husband and wife have to be the best of friends. They have to be, and it's like men understand men way better than, than women understand men, and women understand women way better than men understand women. Uh, and if I, I'm surprised, I think the name is somewhere in there. <laughs> well, um, but it's like you, you, you have, uh, you know, some of that that's there, and, and sometimes you can get couples that get so engrossed, like we have to be just the friends, and we have to be this, that, that they lose the other side of those friendships, and there's no way that as a spouse you can fulfill all of those things. Uh, and uh, and I've seen that with young couples where the romance it's like it has to be this and us and then all the all friendships are neglected uh, and you run into some big troubles uh, that way. But I, I yeah. think one of the best examples in the Bible of, of respect is Mary and Joseph. Joseph had such a respect for Mary even though he knew he wasn't the father of Jesus. I yeah. mean, even when he thought of divorcing her quietly, just. Everything was respectful. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, if you look at Scripture, the most romantic thing in Scripture you see is is Isaac flirting with Rebecca. I mean, aside from that, it's not. There's a lot of stuff in there that doesn't fit a lot of our typical uh, romantic ideas. Song of songs. Song of songs. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's the relationship between Christ and His Church. Well, no, not only that, but that's that's also <laughs> extremely. Uh, it's extremely graphic, and and uh, yeah, it was once said that it, you know it's enough to give an old rabbi a heart attack. We'll do <laughs> so um, yeah, I taught. I was I, I I got pushed and pushed and pushed to teach Song of Solomon to a young adult group, and I got through halfway through chapter two, and I said, I'm sorry, I can't. You guys are snickering too much. Like, We're not going to go there. Um, so <clears throat> friendship was that was that really big uh, thing. <clears throat> that was between guys and, you know, like between two guys and two girls, uh, and that was the, one of the deepest things. Um, then you get to the other social networks that you have. So when you would... Um, go through life how did you find fellowship how did you find community uh one of those ways was within a neighborhood so in some of these places the 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 neighborhood and the town the small town just had such a strong close uh community that you all came together and you knew and this is i mean can you guys think of a modern example of this what? i've seen it in movies and everything there's all sorts of courts and everything out there and every well, it, for me, it's the, you know, you see, you'll see some movie, like say some war movie, like, hey, where are you from? I'm from the Bronx. I'm from the Bronx too, you know, like, you know, they say they're from Harlem, they're from this. You, know, you see how there's that, that commonality that you'd run into because of the neighborhood that you were in. Um, ethnic groups also brought some of that uh, and, and or cities of origin. So like uh, you would go to, into a town and, you know, it was expected that you had a place to stay, and people were expected to provide hospitality, even for strangers. But what was, what, who did you know to go to? Well, you went to the people that you knew of in that city that were the same ethnic group as you, or from the same town as you, uh, where you had grown up. Um, and so you would get to that, that, that location, find this person who's in your town, show up, say, hey, I'm from Grand Rapids. And they'd be like, cool, come on in, even though we don't even know each other. And, and uh, um, and so that's how a lot of how that would work. Um, also, associations, uh, occupations, and religious associations. So associations, meaning they, they had like the trade guilds and things like that. So you were, they had common relationships with that that was similar to the occupations. And then again, uh, religious association, which Christianity was at. So as Paul would go city to city to city, he didn't go stay in hotels. He would walk in. And he would know of the house where a Jew would be, and he would go to that Jewish house, and they would support him, and then or, or let him in, and they would host him. If, when they were hosting him, he, they received what he said, and he would stay there, very similar to what Jesus told the 70. If they receive it, stay and, and be there and bless that house. But if they're like, you're a false teacher or whatever, get out, then he'd go to the next Jewish house, and he would, he would find that. But he is almost always staying with that group as he goes from place to place. Eventually, as the church got established, this became a Christian thing. You'd go and you'd find the Christians uh, and stay with the Christians. Um, so having a well-connected patron in that social group was a real bonus. So if you have this you know, neighborhood, you have this group, 
and then there's somebody who's kind of they're the ones over that neighborhood that really uh, are able to help and support things. It's just kind of like uh, the positive side of the Godfather, uh, but you can have you know this here's this person who's the patron who's over this area. And you knew if you went to them to get help, you could have that help. So some of the social networks, you, the connections you would develop, uh, it was through kinship and marriage, the membership in clubs. So you join the different clubs or join the different. Uh, associations and such um, and then when you got into certain high offices uh, you started to make connections within that new social level and social status uh, and then there would be a number of connections you would make there as social networks um, in the New Testament times these social networks were the primary way that the gospel flowed out so people would come to Christ and it would go into the social network that they had, and it was they would be sh sharing with those um, that were in their group, and that's how it spread quite rapidly. Um, and then ostracisms from these networks were a common form of persecution. So when you did be, sometimes you become a Christian, and this group of friends that you had now shut you out and shut you down, which is a very difficult thing to go through. With this was your main social life and everything that you were doing. Uh, and you had to let them go. And this is why, in that time, the honor uh, and shame type of culture was so strong um, because the, 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 this social network that you had, when you did something that offended them and hurt them and they threatened that ostracism, you changed your behavior because so much of life was that ostracism. Now, this is something we've lost today in, in America because uh, we just, one, we value the person who stands up and is their own individual, uh, which is not something that would have gone by back in the past. Um, and the ability of a community to shame anybody, especially today, doesn't even work because they, they today you just get on social media and immediately find a bunch of people that are going to support you right away and kind of balance out the shame. But when your whole life was this community and you didn't have a whole lot of hope outside of that unless you just left and then they shamed you, you, you gave in and you did a lot of what they, they wanted to do. <laughs> if you were a Christian being shamed into abandoning your Christianity, that was a very difficult test. But this is also why church discipline, as is described in, in the church, and why you, what you see happening in 1 Corinthians worked. Because the moment that you know he had this guy had come into that community, he had those connections that was his life. He starts to have this behavior of living with his father's wife, and they're like, "Nope!" And they immediately treat him as an outsider. He he was losing half of what his life was about, and he had to immediately change and come back. Today, you do that, and they're like, "See ya! I'll go join the church down the road." And and what can you do about it, kind of thing? Um, and then within these social relationships, uh, the, um, you could have some social movement, uh, but most of these things were within their classes, uh, but most of that social movement would occur uh, you know, if you'd done the military service. or This is kind of out of place, actually, now I'm looking at this point. It should have been back with um, you know, some of the social classes because uh, that's basically how you would move in those classes is uh, favor of disfavor of the emperor. So... <laughs> All right, last thing for tonight, <coughs> regions. Um, and uh, just because this was actually a major part of Roman culture was their army. Uh, the legions were comprised of citizen soldiers, much like uh, ours are today. Largely voluntary and professional soldiers, much like ours is today. Uh, they performed a great deal of civic construction, kind of like ours today. <laughs> we do have a lot of uh, ways that our soldiers do do that. Um, but the Roman uh, legions, when they were in an area that was peaceful and they weren't having to fight and they weren't going to war, they were getting up and going and building roads and building aqueducts and, and, and things like that. They were always improving those things that would then also help them if they had to go to war because then they could get from place to place. Uh, they uh, also, uh, within a legion, it was approximately 6,000 men. They say here around 5,300 uh, infantry, around 700 cavalry, and specialists. Uh, and actually, um, they were. You, we're going to see in just a second. They were. They were usually not all the way up to 6,000. 
Um, and these, but these 6,000, I mean, technically it would be, a legion would be 6,000. It would be divided uh, into, oh, here we go. So it would be divided into 10 cohorts of six centuries. So uh, six, the centuries technically were 100 men. Six of those makes 480. And then the 480 times 10 is the uh, 4,000. 800 uh, and oh did I miss all the others I think I accidentally removed the other things but so it starts off with that with what's called a contubernium uh, which is basically your tent mate so the tubernium is uh, tent con is tent with you know and so your contubernium was eight guys uh, and uh, two to a tent but you had a group of those those tents uh, and then you had the centuria, which was made up of 10 contubernium. Uh, let me grab one of the things here, because I know there's details in here. I don't want to forget that I did not put on the slide. And so, um, so the contubernium is similar to, uh, you know, what we call a squad in today's army. You have the centuria, which would be similar to a company in uh, today's army, about 100 guys. And then there would be uh, six of these. Uh, I'm sorry, eight times 10 is 80, not 100. And then there'd be six of those, which is 480, and then 10 of those, which is 4,800. Uh, the remaining 6,000 that we're ta talking about, uh, this is fighting men. And you would have to have a whole bunch of other types of people. You have to have, you know, like in today's army terms, supply sergeant. You have to have engineers. You have to have cooks and, and so on and so forth. So all of that had to be taken into account too. So that factored into that 6,000. Uh, this organization of the army, if you remember, was done by Marcius. We actually talked about it uh, last time before Christmas. Uh, but it deeply impacted how we shaped our army. <laughs> Can you see the similarities? Uh, so you have a squad, a platoon, company or troop, or brigade or squadron. Anyone know the difference between uh, when it goes company, brigade, versus troop or squadron? Anyone? So this is infantry, this is cavalry. So when I was in, I was in cavalry, so I had a troop and I had a squadron, I didn't have a company and a brigade. Uh, and uh, the, the Romans had similar distinction distinct names for their cavalry as well um, but then you get done with that and then you have the division uh, which is made up of all these so we patterned our military a great deal after them the legions they uh, they got paid by their commanding general uh, and a lot of their raises and everything were determined by him uh, and this built a great deal of loyalty in uh, 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4, when it's, Paul is saying to Timothy, um, you know, do not get caught up in civilian affairs, uh, but serve so as to please your commanding officer, uh, like a good soldier. In other words, when you were a soldier, all of your money and everything for your retirement was in your commanding officer. You didn't care what someone else came up and said for you to do if it was different than your commanding officer told you to do. Uh, you would commit, you by come, becoming a centurion, you committed to 20 years, and then she was 25, but 20 years, uh, 225 denarii a year uh, was given to you. A portion of that pay, however, is laid aside in a fund that you will receive upon discharge. So you're being paid a certain amount, but you only get so much of that at the time. The rest is going in sense into a retirement fund that if you are dishonorably discharged, if you run away from the army, if you are kicked out because of disobedience, you lose it. And so it was a motivator to not get kicked out and not to disappoint your commanding off, uh, officer. Um, plus, when a unit did well and behaved heroically within battle, the emperor would often award the unit a certain amount of money that would be divvied up to the soldiers. That also often was a portion held to your retirement. So you did not, when, when, when Paul is saying that, it's not just like a normal soldier, okay, yeah, you want to please your commanding officer. It's like your entirement, your, your retirement, your entire retirement is in this one guy. 
you do want to please him and he's going to give you all of the bonuses and all the rewards and so that's who you're seeking to please and that is to tie us into then our relationship with god why am i going to give in to the desires of the world and be pulled away when my entire retirement <laughs> is in him that's where my inheritance is and everything else um also with this you swore oaths of loyalty to the commander um that was renewed uh, annually and uh this is why some wondered you know can can christians serve as um as legions uh but jesus you know says you know and paul says they were fewer um i think i think jesus is like do they have to stop being um soldiers and he's like no go and serve soldiers don't collect too much taxes don't do this you know there's things that he teaches uh to that effect discipline in the legions uh they did not have a problem with corporal punishment uh we didn't used to have a problem with corporal punishment, but now you get to pull out a little card and then they can't do anything anymore to you. Um, they find ways, though. Trust me, I found that out. Um, but the corporal punishment they had, they could actually they could whip you. Um, and they actually had the authority to execute uh, if they needed to, but they could also fine you um, and give you additional duties. Now, this is the number one thing that we use in our current military. It's called an Article 14. So if you disobey... Uh, and they don't, they're not going to kick you out, uh, then they give you an Article 14. Uh, when that happens, you have two weeks of pay taken from your paycheck, and you're given two weeks of extra duty uh, every time that that happens. Um, they also had a practice called decimation. Now, we've heard of the word, uh, you know, that, that you know, was decimated or something like that. But this is where they would take, of, of the, if a unit was told, you are now going to be decimated. They had to take 10 groups of 10, and then one of those 10 had to be killed by the other nine. And that's how they, that was a punishment that they would give if the, if the unit had shown great cowardice uh, and run. Um, and so this is done seldom, but it's done in Roman history. Uh, and uh, it was a huge, shameful thing to be decimated. But there was one thing more shameful, and that was to be disbanded. Uh, when an entire legion is just disbanded and let go out of punishment, uh, that was extremely shameful. At the end, sometimes you would have, when, when the, it was let go and they had completed and they were going to start up a new legion, uh, um, uh, sorry, do, do, do. sorry, disbanded, I, I went the wrong way with my brain, it's a long day. Uh, so disbanding, the entire legion is disbanded. They, you're done, you don't get your land settlements, you don't get your money, you don't get your retirement, you don't get anything for the whole unit. Uh, and they also forfeit their financial disbursements. That would have been probably true even for the commander and all of that would have gone to whoever uh, was above them. Okay, um, and we, how did this happen? Somehow these next two slides didn't get the color change and, and stuff, so something happened in there that I thought they did it. Uh, the emblems that we have, oh, that's because I was going to skip those and go straight into this. So the emblems, one of the biggest representations of Rome was the eagle. We talked about this before. Uh, the aquila, um, yeah, not, not at all like another country we know about. Uh, this eagle was typically found on the top of their uh, standards. And the, they would carry the standards with them uh, into battle. And then when they would make camp, they would actually create a chapel and put the standards into it. Each one of these would be different awards that were hung on it, and, and they were greatly cherished. Uh, and then the weapons that they used, um, you have the gladius and the pugio. So this is the... Pugio, which is just a smaller blade, probably about yay long. Uh, those of you that saw earlier, this is the gladius that you guys will be able to come up and handle if you want afterwards. Uh, the thing about the gladius is that uh, it was smaller and shorter, and so, oh, my battery's running low. It's a smaller and shorter, so it's easier to maneuver. Um, then they also had the Roman longsword. This is based on that but it would be about how long it is. And the cavalry would use something that's this long because you can reach down from your horse and actually reach the people that are on the ground. 
And so those are some examples of that. Uh, the long broadsword is what that was. This is more of how it would look. Uh, this is the pilum, which is basically a spear. But the interesting thing about this is it was created to be soft right here where it connected to the wood pole so that you would throw it at the person's shield and it would stick in the shield, but then it would also kind of bend and break from the impact. And the person's shield has this thing stuck in it that they can't pull out and reuse and then they can't get it out because it's too, too bendy uh, and it makes the shield uh, unusable. Hmm. Uh, they had things like the Carabaleste, uh, and this shot missiles, you might say. You actually see one here. Um, these things can go through multiple people before they stopped, uh, and uh, they were very deadly. Uh, when they would use them in siege warfare, they'd shoot them over the wall, and of course if you're not looking, it just comes in and just plows through however many people are in its way. Uh, and then you have the Anagar. Uh, which is a form of, of catapult. The trebuchet is one that uses more of a weight that breaks all around, and they did have some of those. Uh, but this uses twisted rope as a spring. Uh, and that's what the, the as well as what uh, this used, it's twisted rope right here. And so they had, they would get those ropes at a tension, so much so that they pull back on those ropes, and it was the ropes that actually flung it back. Uh, so you have the auxiliaries. Uh, um, these were the non-Roman troops. Uh, their family and they would receive the citizenship on discharge. Uh, and a lot of these auxiliaries tended to be um, uh, specialized troops, like you know, slingers, archers, uh, and, and cavalry, not so much the, the, the foot soldiers. Uh, and they would be commanded by a prefect of equestrian rank. Uh, and so, as it says here, this practice plus the transfer of troops did much to spread Roman culture and to mix the races. So they would go into an area like Judea, and there would be troops that were brought in, trained and equipped like Romans, grouped like Romans, commanded like Romans, and would help the Roman uh, uh, um, troops as well, but they were made up of the natives of that area. The troops that came to uh, um, take Jesus from uh, um, the Garden of Gethsemane would have been auxiliaries, not the Roman soldiers. Uh, there's a big other crowd that comes, but they would have been auxiliaries that would have uh, participated with the temple security and so on and so forth, made up of Jews. And it's not until they take Jesus to Pilate and then Pilate releases him to his soldiers that now the actual Roman soldiers would get involved in what is happening there. Uh, the Praetorian Guard... Uh, you had nine to 12 cohorts making up the emperor's personal bodyguard. Uh, and these were kind of like the secret service to some extent, uh, but they were actually very powerful. These were the people that re uh, got command of these were very important uh, people. Uh, and the Praetorian ends up um, in latter years almost determining who is the next emperor. Um, another one, I guess I forgot the font color, but... Uh, you had a navy. Well, I guess blue is good for navy. Um, yeah, they only had two main navy ports, Mycenaeum and Ravenna. So Mycenaeum is where the navy was at when, uh, um, and the commander of it was Pliny the Elder when Mount Vesuvius goes off in the 70-something uh, AD. And so he takes portions of the navy to go and help at Mount Vesuvius. Uh, but that was that because that was where one of their bases was. The other one being up in Ravenna for the other sea. And then this was the typical Roman boat. Uh, hopefully this will last, my, my battery on my laptop will last long enough to get this done. Uh, you would have had slaves inside the boat that were rowing with the oars. And uh, the Romans kind of commanding. Sometimes you would have troops as well uh, that could be equipped to fight. But the main goal of the Roman ships was to take this front ram and get positioned with the enemy ship and ram and sink the ship. Uh, hmm. And or to come alongside it and they would have these bridges that they dropped down that with grapplings that would grab onto the other ship uh, and then they'd walk across and do hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, it's not until a little bit later that you start seeing any sort of weapon mounted to the decks of the ship. Uh, to shoot at the other ships and when they did a lot of it was attempting to shoot fiery arrows and things to get the other ship um, to burn 
And uh, to be on one of those ships burning when you were down here was not a good idea because you typically were chained to the ship uh, and you weren't going to uh, get out. Uh, they did have one ancient weapon, and I don't remember where I read it or if it was Roman times, but I just got to tell you for the fun of it, um, it was a city that was right on the water and it was a giant grappling hook that grabbed, flung down, grabbed the ship and lifted the ship, the crane, out of the water until just everybody fell off the ship and then they would drop the ship back down. And I'm, I thought, man, that's, that's something I haven't seen Hollywood try yet. It would be a fun one to see. Here. So, all right, that's it for this week. And we'll see you guys next week. All right, guys.